All right, so this is AP Macros FRQ from uh, 1999. So it says, following an, an increase in demand for money, an open economy is experiencing a significant increase in real interest rates relative to the rest of the world. So explain how this increase in interest rates, I'm going to highlight that, will affect each of the following for the country. So an increase in interest rates, and how would that infect, affect uh, first off investment? So when interest rates increase, that means that investment is going to decrease. So this is one, um, excuse me, this is one AI. And that's just something to memorize basically with macro is um, there's certain things, and I don't know what I'm doing. There's certain things that are just have these relationships. So one AI, I'm just gonna say I decreases. I'm not even gonna try to write a whole word. So investment will decrease, and the reason why is because interest is basically what you have to pay on a loan. So if what you have to pay on a loan increases, you're going to start to take less loans. And um, investment is done mainly through loans, basically, in the eyes of uh, macroeconomics. So whenever it costs more to take out a loan, then you're going to invest less. So investment will decrease. Now, the international value of the currency. So how will real interest rates affect that? So this is just another thing to remember, international value of the currency. Whenever there's an increase in real interest rates, there's going to be a um, an appreciated currency. So I'm just going to do a quick supply and demand graph. This is pretty awful, but this is S, this is D. So whenever there's an increase in real interest rates in the country, the demand for the currency increases, and that's going to make it appreciate because it is relatively more valuable. Um, so that's just always something to remember whenever interest rates increase in a country, then the currency will appreciate. If it decreases relative to other countries, then it'll most likely depreciate um, unless there's, you know, other factors involved. But usually whenever they're talking about interest rates, it's just a simple increase, appreciate, decrease, depreciate. Um, I mean, obviously, there's other things that shift the curves there, but interest rates are an easy one to remember. So exports. So whenever a currency appreciates, that means it becomes more valuable relative to other currencies. So it's actually going to cost more um, to get that currency. So whenever things cost more, you tend to do less of it. So say you're in another country, right, and you're importing U.S. goods. Now the United States currency has appreciated. You're going to import less goods. That means that you, the United States is going to have less exports because it's going to cost more to uh import those goods from or it's going to cost more for foreign countries to import United States goods which is going to cause a decrease in exports um, due to the appreciated currency so we'll just say exports decrease and if you're actually writing the FRQ you'd say um, because this is an explain one you'd say exports decrease because the currency appreciates making it more valuable uh, relative to the foreign purchasers um, who are going to be importing those goods, and you'll get the point. So, let's go to 1B now. So, using a correctly labeled aggregate demand and aggregate supply diagram, show how the increase, uh, or show, show how the change in investment you identified in Part A will affect each of the following in the short run. So, in Part A, we identified that this will occur, that investment will decrease, right? So when investment decreases, that means that aggregate demand is going to have to decrease because investment is a component of aggregate demand, um, which is basically, sorry, I'm having trouble using this. A aggregate demand is everything that makes up um, GDP. So when anything that's in GDP falls, aggregate demand will fall. So we're just going to make a little aggregate demand graph here. I'm having a lot of trouble using this Wacom. It's tiny. It's not very good, but whatever. We'll make it work. So this is AD. This is your short run aggregate supply. Um, I'm just going to label this real GDP for now because I'm having, again, difficulty actually using technology and price level. Of course, whenever you actually do an FRQ, you're going to want to write out price level and write out real GDP just to be sure. So here's your initial equilibrium. I'm just going to do PL1 and then Y1. It says nothing about the um, long run aggregate supply, so you don't even have to write it. Um, and then here's 82 showing the decrease in aggregate demand. 
And then we're going to also show the new equilibrium, which is going to be y2. And then always draw an arrow whenever there's a decrease or an increase to where the new equilibrium is relative to the first one. You should always do that because you're going to get, um, it's, it's just going to make the grading easier for the graders. So always do that. So now let's see. So we did the change in investment will affect aggregate demand. So aggregate demand decreases. Um, how will it affect output? So whenever aggregate demand decreases, real GDP decreases. So that means that outputs down and then the price level also decreases. So the price level goes down. So um, you could just show how this will affect it using arrows or I like to actually write it out whenever um, it asks me. So I, I would do like 1bi and then just say output if I can actually write it well decreases and then do the same thing for BII and say price level decreases just to be sure you get the points um, or alternatively you could circle these arrows and then write 1BI just to show how there's a change in output um, now I'm not sure how they're going to grade it because I'm not a grader so I would do either one of these things uh, if not both just to be sure you get the points um, so yeah, that's basically that for aggregate demand. So now, identify one fiscal policy that could counter the effects in part B. So basically they're asking, what is a fiscal policy that could make aggregate demand increase? Um, so whenever you know that, that makes it much easier. So the one fiscal policy we're gonna use here um, is going to be, we're going to increase government spending. That's what I always advise. If they say fiscal policy, I wouldn't do taxes. I like increasing government spending. Um, this isn't like a personal, like political belief. It's just that it's easier to draw on a graph because oftentimes they're going to do, um, the loanable funds market and it's easier to explain government spending with loanable funds than it is to for, for taxes, I believe. So we're going to say increase government spending. So now it's going to ask us, explain how this policy will change or will affect each of the following. So one C I. Um, output will increase, so I'm just going to write O increases, 1CII. The price level will also increase because aggregate demand is increasing. So whenever you're actually doing this explanation, just say output increases because aggregate demand increases. Um, the price level increases because aggregate demand increases. Uh, and then the nominal interest rate. So this one's interesting. So whenever there's um, an increase in the price level, right? That means an increase in inflation. So banks are going to want to counter out this inflation with uh, or by increasing nominal interest rates. So your nominal interest rates will increase. That's kind of intuitive, I think, but you know, just wanted to explain that just in case. So your nominal interest rates, uh, they will increase. And then the price of bonds, there's an inverse relationship or a negative relationship. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the difference is because they use and my teacher used them pretty much interchangeably, but I know that there's obviously a mathematical difference between inverse and negative, but whatever. So there's an opposite relationship between uh, the effect of a nominal interest rate and the effect on, on bonds. So when nominal interest rates increase, that means the price of existing bonds decrease. And now my explanation for that is, and I'm not sure because I'm not an actual like paid economist, is that um, whenever we have current nominal interest rates increasing um the price of previously issued bonds who have those lower nominal interest rates relative to the to the higher nominal interest rates now it's going to it's going to decrease because not many people are going to want to buy those bonds so price of bonds decreases either way um that's basically uh, you could you could even just say price of bonds decrease because nominal interest rates increase and you get the point for explanation so don't even worry about that too much so now 1D, identify one monetary policy action that could counter the effects identified in Part B. So again, one monetary policy that would increase aggregate demand. So using a correctly labeled money market graph, show how this policy will affect nominal interest rates. So the money market, it's it's this graph. So, <laughs> I mean, everything is that graph. So it's, yeah, the money supply. Um, we're going to show an increase in the money supply. So this is going to be MS1. Is going to be MS2. Increase the money supply. It's going to um, have the money demand here. 
So now it's just your pick of uh, one monetary policy. I would just say buy bonds. They often use open market operations or whatever. Um, and I think buy bonds are the easiest just to remember because buy bonds, big bucks. Um, that's what I believe that's what five steps to a five AP macro always. It was like if you buy bonds, you're going to increase the money supply. So it's just easier to remember for me at least. So now that's going to decrease the nominal interest rates. So here's R1, here's R2. It's going to decrease it. This is going to be nominal interest rates. And again, you should write this all out whenever you're actually doing an FRQ, but for the purpose of practice, I'm not going to do that. So this is quantity of money. So Q of money. And then here's Q1, Q2. All right. So I identified the monetary policy, the action that could counter the effects in Part B by increasing our demand, um, you'd incre or sorry, increase the money supply. So whenever you increase the money supply, it's going to decrease nominal interest rates. When nominal interest rates decrease, we're going to have an increase in investment. When investment increases, aggregate demand will increase. So you don't actually have to explain that. You just have to show the graph. And that's it for this question. Um, I will go and then I'll do the next one right now. All right. So question two, assume an open economy with the public sector. Identify two methods of calculating gross domestic product for this country or economy. So one method is the expenditure approach. And that's going to be where you count up all the spending in the economy. And then the other one is going to be the income approach where you count up the like, uh, what I think it's rent went rent wages income stuff like that I, I only learned the expenditure approach whenever i took it um but it is expenditure and income approach and then explain why these two uh, methods of approaching must yield the same value all we have to do basically is say that expenditures ultimately become income equal income in the end um, so that's your, that's your basic explanation, or you could say something like your sum of your factor payments and your profit is going to have to equal expenditures or say something about the circular flow model or something like that. So next one, identify one shortcoming of using gross domestic product as an indicator of the actual level of national output. So you can identify literally like it, there's so many options here. So you have illegal economy. So if you're selling illegal goods. Um, then it's not going to be counted in your GDP. If you have home production, like if you make a pie, it's not going to be counted in GDP. So I would just use those two. You could say something about a barter economy. Um, it's, it's not too hard there. So if nominal GDP increased by 4% in 1996, identify two additional pieces of information you need to conclude. Before you can conclude that the living standard of the typical person is increased by 4% during this year. So this one's actually kind of a mouthful, but it's easy. So all you have to say is inflation rate. So whenever the nominal interest rate or nominal GDP increases and you don't have an inflation rate, um, that's pretty useless because you don't know if inflation increased by like 200% um, and then production actually decreased. You have no idea. So inflation rate. I'd say that that one just automatically pops in my mind. Um, and now you it, it's it's talking about the living standard of a typical person. So I would say population growth would be a good one here too. Um, because it's talking about GDP per capita there. And so whenever the population grows more than the GDP does, um, then the, the GDP per capita, per capita should decrease. So... Finished all of question two. So now question three, assume an increase in, or sorry, this is all two, by the way, this isn't one, whatever. Assume an increase in net investment, or sorry, explain how an increase in net investment will affect each of the following. So an increase in net invest, investment, whenever, or sorry, whenever investment increases, aggregate demand increases, and again, that's just because investment is a component of aggregate demand. So that's all you have to write there. Um, capital stock, I'm just going to do II for now. And whenever you actually do an FRQ, you should really do 3A II um, like that. But for the purpose of this, I'm, I may not do that. So increasing net investment, 
It's going to increase aggregate demand because aggregate demand is made up of C plus I plus G plus X minus M, which is the GDP equation. Capital stock. So an increase in that investment will increase capital stock um, because you're actually just investing. You know, so it, it's by definition, pretty much capital stock is is investment. So capital stock increases because investment increases. Um, and explanations in macro, you don't really have to explain too much, but make sure you at least try to. You'll, you'll usually get the point if you try to. Long run aggregate supply. So long run aggregate supply increases because capital stock increases. So that means that you're going to have um, a shift to the right of the long run aggregate supply curve, which is actually going to increase output because capital stock increases. So output will increase. because capital stock increases and and also because aggregate demand and longer long run aggregate supply both increase so if you have you know here is just kind of in i'm not even going to label the the x-axis so this is real gdp this is price level long run aggregate supply um increases so here's your original aggregate demand here's your new one so here's your new production is at this point here in real gdp it's a little abstract but you have an increase in production or whatever um, or increase in output, they say. So explain how an increase in net investment will uh, affect the country's production possibilities curve. So that's just going to shift the production crap. Shift the production possibility curve rightward. So PPC increases, or you could say shifts right. All right, and so that was all of um, 1999's FRQ. So we did that in around like 20 minutes, so not too bad. Uh, I'll do another one probably soon, and hopefully this was slightly helpful. I don't. I